The book of Acts, or some people will call it the Acts of the Apostles, okay? Now, the book of Acts was written by Luke, the author of the third gospel. And by the way, folks, the book of Acts is also the continuation of that narrative. Now, some say uh, Dr. Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke, um, wrote this book like uh, uh, Luke and Acts together. <laughs> it's just one book, but they divided or one book in, with two volumes. Are you with me? So the book is of highest importance because it is the only inspired account of the beginning and early work of the church. Now it clarifies some of the historical references in the Pauline epistle. Now, you know, for some of you, we have studied the um, Corinthians to Revelation and obviously we pass through all the epistles, uh, pretty much all the epistles of the Apostle Paul. Now, uh, like the Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, and all that. And we are going to study them here when Paul ministered to that certain area. Amen? Are you with me? Now, its place in the New Testament canon identifies it as the bridge from the Gospels to the Epistles. So the, the book of Acts is the bridge from the Gospels to the Epistles. All right? Does that make sense to you folks? Now, let's just jump to the text now. Because this morning, it's going to be, uh, I believe, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Lord willing, we are going to learn the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the believers. And uh, I asked Brother Bobby this morning to, to put some Greek words uh, for us on our monitor so that you can take note. But before I go there, let me read to you Luke chapter 24, verse 49. It says there, Jesus speaking here on Luke chapter 24, verse 49, it says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Underline the word upon there if, you, if you're following me in your Bible. In, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. What is that promise? The promise of the Father. The promise of the Father is the helper, that is the Holy Spirit. Amen. But notice it's upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, here's the key, folks. Listen to me on this one. When the Holy Spirit is upon you, that is the time you are going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Now, we are going to use some Greek words this morning that will clarify a lot of doctrines. And in clarifying some doctrines, folks, it's like you turn on the light into a dark place. And when you turn on the light into a dark place, you will see good stuff and bad stuff. Are you with me? Right? That is the word of truth. That's why when Jesus preached, folks, He's turning on the light because He's the light. And when you preach the truth, Sometimes bad people who have bad doctrines in them, they get offended. And that's not my intention. That's not His intention. When Jesus was here on earth, it, it, it is not His um, intention to offend someone. It's just to bring the truth. Now it's up to you, it's up to the people to receive the truth or harden your heart to the truth and get offended. Amen? Does that make sense to you folks? Now, just don't shoot the messenger, okay? I'm just a messenger, folks. Now, check this out. Book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, 
until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Now folks, so this book, if you would, was written continuation of the gospel of Luke. When it says here on verse 1, the former account, underline those words in your Bible, Bible students, the former account there is the gospel of Luke. This is the continuation, basically what Luke is saying here, the continuation of that former account right here. Okay? I, that is Dr. Luke, was, by the way folks, Dr. Luke was the only Gentile author of the <laughs> New Testament, if you will. Are you with me? It says, the former account I made of Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now, the name Theophilus here is a Greek name. We don't really know who was this Theophilus. He was only mentioned twice in the Bible, in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 1, and here in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1. Some say he was the master of Dr. Luke. Probably he was a Roman official who, uh, who, because back then it's different now. The doctor, now they have the money, right? And then if you're a doctor, you know, they have the money. But back then the doctors were slave. Were slave, folks. So some say, tradition say, he was the master of Dr. Luke. But one thing we know for sure, he was in a high position. He was in a high position, folks. But there's another tradition that they say that Theophilus, some say, was only a symbol for the lovers of God. You know why? Let's break down his name, okay? Bible students, are you ready to take out your Bible and your pen? The word Theo means what? God. God. Okay? The word philos, or that's where we get the Greek word kileo. Love. Or love. A love of God. Kind of like that. Or love of God. Or lovers of God. And so, some say Theophilus was only a symbol for the lovers of God. And in general, this letter is dedicated to the lovers of God. And I don't know if that's true or what, but again, it's just tradition. And, and tradition, some say, sometimes it's hard to prove those. Amen? Do you believe that? But guess what, folks? Whether this is a real person or the lovers of God, we can benefit from this book. Amen? I'm just setting the foundation to you right now, folks. So, so it says here on verse 2, Until the day in which he was taken up, that is the when he ascended into heaven, after he through the Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, two things I want to point out to you in verse 2. First of all, he was taken up, or three things, actually, sorry, three things. His ascension and also the commandments to the apostles. But the question I have is this, what is the commandments that he spoke to the apostles before he ascended to heaven? Can I answer that for you folks? Folks, that commandment we know as today as the Great Commission. It was on Matthew chapter 28 verse uh, 18 to 20. Can I read it to you folks so that we can answer all of these things? Now, okay. Now, listen to this one. 
And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Are you with me on that? And folks, we read the other part of that. It's on Luke chapter 24, verse 49. It says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. That's on Luke 24, verse 50. Now 51, it says, Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. Do you see that, folks? And so the commandments that he gave to his apostles is to make disciples. Amen? You know what, folks? That is the goal that we need to have as a church. To preach the gospel to this lost and dying world and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? If we don't do that, I mean, you know, the Bible says if a church doesn't evangelize, or uh, one preacher says, a, a, a church that doesn't evangelize will be fossilized. You see? I mean, that's the reality, folks. And so if I read to you verse 2 again of the book of Acts chapter 1, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostle, apostles whom he had chosen. That's the number three that I want to point out to you. Whom he had chosen. He chose us first. <laughs> then we chose him. He chose us folks. That's why it's such a great privilege for all of us to be chosen by the Almighty God, the Creator of all. Hallelujah. Amen. To whom he also presented himself, notice, alive and dead. <laughs> Hallelujah. Alive and not dead after his suffering by many, notice, infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now folks, the enemies of the gospel denies the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that? You know why? Because if they can prove or if they can discourage people that Jesus did not resurrect from the dead, guess what? Your faith is what? Dead. In vain. That's why he says, oh, no, Jesus is not resurrect, did not resurrect, folks. But here, he presented himself alive after his suffering. What is his suffering? It's crucifixion, folks. Okay? By many infallible proofs being seen by them. How long? During 40 days. So the Lord did not just resurrect it and had um, seen once, but many times He stayed here on earth for 40 days between His resurrection and ascension. Is that is that for you, like something for you to learn now? Like, oh really? I didn't know that, that after He resurrected that He stayed 40 more days here on earth. Folks, notice what he was doing on those 40 days. He's speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. What is he doing? Teaching his apostles, his disciples, his followers uh, uh, pertaining um, uh, to the kingdom of God. Nothing like unusual or weird, weird uh, uh, emotionalism, folks. He's speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
Now I'm going to give you some five infallible proofs, which by the way, there are more, okay, that Jesus is alive. Please say amen. amen. All right, number one is this. Do you remember in Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 32, that Jesus presented himself to the two disciples that traveled to um, Emmaus. Emmaus. Remember, they were talking about Jesus, you know, and Jesus showed up and he taught them about <laughs> pertaining to the kingdom of God. They didn't even know that was Jesus who's talking to them. Do you remember that? So that's infallible proof, folks. Right? Now, number two, another proof is this. On the resurrection day, he presented himself alive to Mary Magdalene. Do you remember that? Now, also on the same day, the resurrection day, in the evening, he appears to the disciples and Thomas being absent. That same day, on the resurrection day, he's alive. Amen? Okay, there you go. Number four is this. Is this. Same day, same evening, he appears to the disciples at this time with Thomas. So he's alive, right? And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, at one point, he appeared to the disciples, to his followers, more than 500 of them. He's alive. Those are infallible proofs, folks, that being seen by them during 40 days that Jesus is alive and guess what they have seen him also ascended up into heaven Jesus is alive Hallelujah, folks now look at this verse 4 and being assembled together with them he commanded them do not depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said you have heard from me now so he commanded his disciples to stay in Jerusalem that's why I, I entitled our message this morning wait in Jerusalem because the promise you are going to receive it where in Jerusalem right the, the, the promise of the father you will receive that promise in Jerusalem and Jesus said which you have heard from me. When was that? When? Well, it's on John chapter 14, verse 16 through 17. Can I read it to you? I believe uh, Brother Bobby has the uh, monitor going for us. Look at this. Or let me go back a little bit to verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another helper, another helper, that He may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells, underline this word, the word with, okay? with you and will be under like this word in you if you follow me on your bible folks if you turn on john chapter 14 verse 17 i want you to underline two words for me and for you okay <laughs> the word with and the word in okay now we'll talk about the ministry of the holy spirit here okay but let me pause there and let me go back to Acts chapter 1 verse 4. It says again here, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days 
from now. Now, there is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I will get into detail when we go in, in Acts chapter 2. Now, folks, baptism of the Holy Spirit, not like other um, a sect, a religious group that say baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, you're not saved yet. The reason why you're not saved yet is because this. You don't speak in tongues. Because look at the day of Pentecost, they speak in tongues. You know, like that. No, it's not about that. I will teach you today what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. So, here's the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the believers. Number one is this. You underline that word in John chapter 14, verse 17. The word with. For He dwells with you. And that Greek word, folks, is the Greek word para. Brother Bobby, there you go. Para. Okay. So, the Holy Spirit dwells with you. And the second is this. He will be in you. And that is, the Greek word is en. En. E-N. Okay. You can hear that all the clicking. That is, Brother Bobby looking for the word N that he typed already this morning. <laughs> but E N, all right? There you go. So the first one is para, the second is N. And now, if you go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, okay, Jesus said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, in verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, the word upon is the Greek word epi. Okay? Now underline that word and put epi on top of it. Are you guys with me? So if we could put it all together, it would be para and epi. Are you with me on that? Now, folks, if you understand those three words in Greek, you will understand the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Right here. Right here. Folks, I'm not, this is the Lord. This is the Lord showing us this, the doctrine right here of the Holy Spirit. How He ministered into each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit father us and us and be us. Okay? Now, so Papa is with you and is in you and he is upon you. So right here, right here, that is Papa. If this is the Holy Spirit, this is you, that is Papa. It's not Papa in the things. Like Papa, you know. Right there, Papa. Now, and is this, the Holy Spirit is this, and that is you, is living in you. But empty is different. Empty is right there. Overflows. That's it. Did you get that? Para and empty. Now, folks, if you get that, so the Holy Spirit is with you. It means, folks, what is that supposed to mean? Drawing us into relationship with Jesus Christ when we were not believers yet. You know, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life because He's with you. You understand that? It is not you. Oh, I choose him. No, the Bible clearly says he chose us. He works in us. He's working in us. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to drawing us into relationship with Jesus Christ when we were non-believers. Now, how? He convicted us of our sins. Remember back then when you were a non-believer and they preached to 
give you the gospel and let's say you did not receive Jesus yet, but you were planted. Uh, there's a seed that is planted in your heart. And then whenever you do something bad after that, you're just like, you feel like, wow, before I'm not convicted about this, but now I am being convicted of my sins. Guess what? The Holy Spirit is working in you, with you right there, and trying to draw you that you need Jesus. You see, if this is, I cannot use that anymore because it's filled with water. If this is you, and this is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working in you and pointing you directly to Christ, that you need a Savior. That's it. Do you understand that? Now the word end. Now when you open your heart to Jesus because you were convicted of your sins, and because of that conviction, you go, Oh, I need a Savior. What, what am I going to do? I need to open my life to Jesus Christ. I need to open my heart to Jesus. I will receive Him as my Lord and Savior. When you receive Him as your Lord and Savior, guess what? You will be end right there with the Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit will dwell in you. Is that very clear, folks? Now you are being identified with Christ. Are you with me? Alright? Now, folks, now, that is the time when we were born again. Now, I remember when I was in the Catholic religion, folks, I thought born again is a religion. No. Jesus clearly says it's something must happen in you. Right? So, that's how you will become born again. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, you know how that works? The application for us there is this. Now you're a Christian now. And, and sometimes you can hear that still, small voice. You hear that still, small voice. It's just like something you need to do. Something you... And it's like something's not right in this one. That is the Holy Spirit speaking to you from within. But before you became a believer, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you from your sins. Pointing you to Jesus. Now, the next word is what? Epi. So, can I just read to you verse 6, 7, and 8, and then I will jump on the word epi. Okay? Look at verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times and seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Can I pause there? Now listen to me, folks. It is very clear <laughs> with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ that it is not for you who the followers of Jesus, the people, to know times or seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. That's why those people who predict that Jesus is coming on this certain day, on that day, on that day, and then there's a lot of books and all of that, you know, don't even listen to them. Jesus didn't even answer them. Very clear, it is not for you to know times or seasons. There are things for us to understand, and it, they are clearly on black and white right here. That's what we need to focus. And on the things that we don't really understand, and the Father kept it to us as a secret, guess what? <laughs> you know, just leave the secret to Him. Okay? Worry on the things that you understand. Alright? Focus on those and live to them. Right? Amen? Now, Verse, or before I go to verse 8, I ask myself here, I even put it on my note by the way, why did God allow us not, or why did God allow us not to know the times and seasons of the kingdom? I ask myself that, why Lord, why? I think because if we know, we do whatever we want to do, such as sin, right? If you, we know the times and seasons, we will just go, okay, I know when He's coming. 
I know when he's going to set his kingdom, guess what? I am just going to sin as much as I can. And then, if he will come on June, let's say, this is pretend, okay? I'm just pretending, okay? If he will come on June 3rd, 2014, then I, will, I, I still have enough time for, I still have enough time to sin. Sin up to June 2nd, and then confess my sin on June 2nd, um, 11.30 p.m., and receive him as my Lord and Savior, and then, boom, he showed up the next day I'm saved. You see, folks, because we know the times and season, right? Folks, I think the reason why he did, God did not allow us to understand or to know the times and season, because God wanted us to be ready at all times his return. Do you agree with me on that, folks? Being ready at all times will make us all watchful and prayerful. Amen? And so, therefore, this will prevent us from sinning. Amen? Now, verse 8, and then we'll done. We'll, we'll, I don't want to jump too much here. I, do, I want you to enjoy the relationship of the Holy Spirit into each believer. It's right here. Look at verse 8. But you shall receive power. The word power here is dunamis. That is dynamic power for service to live the Christian life. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come, has epi, uh, has epi you, if you will. Again, the word epi means over or to overflow, or you will take note. The word epi, the word upon, it means over or to overflow. So, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has overflow you, if you will. Is that very simple right there? And then it says, listen folks, and you shall be witnesses to me, first, notice, in Jerusalem, and then in Judea, and then in Samaria, the surrounding region, and to the end of the earth. Now, folks, so you understand the para, you understand the end, and now let's talk about the epi, the overflow. Folks, I believe this is the, one of the most uh, misunderstood word right here because this word epi is also known, what we know today, as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Empowering of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit <laughs> overflows in you, that's where you start witnessing for Jesus. To Jesus. Now, folks, here's the bottom line. How do we know that the Holy Spirit has come upon us? Or has it be us? How do we know? Are we going to be like those people in the day of Pentecost start speaking in the Ashalamala Shala Shalama 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 and all that? You know, I'm not putting that down. Because, folks, it happened. But according to the Apostle Paul, speaking of tongue is not the only gift. Alright? Do you understand that? See, the problem I have now is the modern day, what they call themselves, the Pentecostal group. Not all of them, not all of them, okay? Some of them, they will teach their people like this. You are not baptized with the Holy Spirit because you don't speak in tongue yet. That's terrible. That's terrible. So none of us here, or maybe there are some of us here that, that have the gift, you know? But that's not the only gift of the Spirit. There's a gift of apostle. There's a gift of teacher. There's a gift of tongue. There's a gift of interpretation. But if you look at the list of the, the, the gift of the Spirit, 
tongue and interpretation are last. Do you understand? But anyway, folks, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. How do we know that the Holy Spirit has empty you or empty us? Well, it, it's so clear right here. And you shall be witnesses to me first in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What is that supposed to mean, folks? When you are baptized, when you are happy, when the Holy Spirit has happy you right there, you are going to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Amen? I want to hear amen on that one. Do you understand? What is that supposed to mean? You will start sharing Jesus to the lost and dying world. You, you, it's like you go somewhere, you look for an opportunity where you can share Jesus Christ. Do you understand that, folks? It just happened. It says here, and you shall be witnesses. Underline the word witnesses here, folks. The word witnesses in Greek here is the word martis. Martis. M A R T Y S. Martis. Now, if you want the Greek uh, number, also it's three one four four. Just in case, I'll give you the detail right there. Okay. <laughs> if you have a, a Greek a, a Bible, I'll just give you the number three one four four. Now, notice it was used. If I'm not mistaken. 29 times as witnesses and three times as were the English word martyrs. Martyr. As a matter of fact, I can give you an example. When Stephen, the first martyr of the church, remember Stephen, they were stoned him? That is 3144 in Greek, the word martyrs. Now in Revelation, and on the Revelation, uh, uh, chapter 17 and chapter 2, there's word martyrs there. It was used also. The martyrs that we talk about in the book of Revelation. 3144, the Greek number right there. Now folks, Jesus clearly said, You shall receive this power with the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me now folks notice be witnesses not to witness you're not just going to witness but you are going to be witnesses in other words you are proclaiming okay now the word witness here is one who proclaim what he believes he leaves what he believes. He is what he believes. And if necessary, he will die for what he believes. That's what witnesses is. Do you understand that? That is a strong word right here, folks. In other words, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, folks, guess what? You are going to live for Christ. You are going to preach Christ. You are going to share Christ. That with this life that you have, people around you, they will see Jesus in you, overflowing through you. Do you understand that? Now, there are times, folks, that the Spirit is only in us. Let's just face it. We're still saved, but we are living a life that is not empowered with the Holy Spirit. And I believe our part, our duty, is to stay close to the Spirit as much as possible and ask the empowering of the Holy Spirit in our life. Amen? Do you understand that? Which one do you want? Just para and N, or you want the complete package. Para and Epi. 
it is up to us and that we have been for part right now. Folks, the time the Spirit will is not appearing in us when we still go back to the lifestyle of this world. Do you understand that? And let me tell you that, folks. Let me tell you this. If we are kid, no, that doesn't mean we're not saved. We're still saved. We're still going to heaven. But we are a powerless Christians. Do you want that? Well, the main purpose for us to be here is to become, is to be witnesses to Jesus. That's clearly, right? But notice, notice, he says, to me first, or to me, in number one of this list, Jerusalem. It should start in the home first. Amen. How's your witness at home? Uh oh, Pastor, now, can we got me personal now? Very important. It start at home first, then outside the home, and then to the ends of the earth. Did you understand that, folks? Pala and Epi. Perhaps all of us here, if not most of us here in this room, experience Pala and N. The end. Okay? E N. Alright? With the Holy Spirit, you have experienced Him with you and in you. Now my question is this. Have you experienced the Holy Spirit coming upon you and be you? You see, folks, perhaps not. Perhaps maybe the Holy Spirit sometimes is not home really in your heart because of your lifestyle. Again, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we are going to be witnesses to Jesus Christ. I want you to know this the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to point people and draw them into relationship with Christ and to empower them for Christ. What is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Is to reject Jesus, right? Reject whom he testified. And so, brothers and sisters, live a powerful life, a life that is Overflow with the Holy Spirit. Did you guys learn something? Will you all please stand? Let's pray.